we're going to have right now a word of prayer because this is a weekend that we need to remember. I think during these last several months, we have learned to appreciate the freedoms that in somewhat have been denied us. But sometimes we forget that with every freedom, someone has paid the price for that freedom. This is Memorial Day weekend where we remember, we thank God for the lives of the men and women who when the battle call came, followed it and charged it in the battle in order that we may have a country like we have today. Father, I thank you for our services, men and women. Lord, I thank you that, God, we had to fight a battle the United States did in order to become a country with freedom. And every person that's laid down their life, Father, has laid it down in order that that freedom be preserved. And I pray, dear God, that you would renew that, that thought in our mind. And Lord, we not forget. And Lord, help us to remember a cross. Because your son Jesus paid a price for us to live in freedom. Freedom is costly. And so I thank you for those, and I thank you for Jesus, who has granted that freedom. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to deal with a little wind here. You want to go ahead and open your Bibles. I'll be in the sixth chapter of the book of Matthew. These last several weeks, I don't know about you, but I've had a lot of time to think about things. And, in, and God has used these times to kind of just challenge me and where I am, who I am. And it's caused me to really go back and really look again afresh at certain things in the scripture. We have in the New Testament two terms that we hear. One term is a follower of Christ. Another term is a disciple of Christ. I've been a pastor now for 46 years. And in these years, I remember that we have strived to fulfill the command of God. And that command of God, if I want to recall your memory, was to go and make disciples. That was the initial command. And then how do we make disciples? We teach, you, teach them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And so, as I begin to look in the Greek and the Hebrew, I had to look in books because I have a lot of trouble with English, much less Hebrew or Greek. But in the Greek, in the New Testament, whenever the word follower is used, there's, there's a differentiation between what those words mean. One simply mean, meant those that followed Christ where he went. And when you read, all you have to do is read the book of Matthew, and you'll find out the thousands upon thousands of people, men, women, boys, and girls, followed Jesus wherever he went. They literally chased him up to a mountain. And there were times he'd get in a boat with his disciples just to, to get away from the crowd because people were following him. And in that group that Jesus had were men that he called disciples. Those were the men that God chose in discipleship. And that, that choosing was a training in order that when he ascended into heaven, these men he had entrusted the gospel to. They had seen everything that he had done. He had heard the words that they had taught. He would even teach and then draw them a line aside and, and give them uh, insight into what he said. These were the men that God would look to in order to rouse the nations with the gospel of Christ. And, and so there's a misnomer that disciples are only found in the New Testament. But that can't be right because when Jesus left, he said for us, to go to the world. In Acts, he explained where the world is, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, 
and then the uttermost. The uttermost are those places that we may not even know what the name of that place is. There are places I've heard some 3,400 tribes and of people with a with a language, but a language that's not written down. There, there are people that have never been reached yet with this gospel of Jesus Christ. And the charge was go to all the world. You notice he didn't say skip where you are. They began in Jerusalem. They began in an upper room and out of the thousands of people that followed Jesus, I think it's unique that we read that 120 of them counted the apostles, the, the disciples, gathered in this upper room to wait, to wait for the coming of the Spirit, to wait for the coming of the empowering. Now, they did not know what that would look like. They did not know exactly what that would be, except it would be the presence of Jesus in their life. And so we read then that these disciples were sent out to make other disciples. The ones that sent out are were named the apostles. Apostle simply means sent one. And as I was thinking about this, I've wondered if maybe the reason that we really don't get involved in, in becoming this disciple, becoming a disciple of Christ, and we're gonna look at what that looks like in a little bit, is maybe we're afraid that once we surrender everything to God, we're afraid he'll send us to places, and usually the first place people send, think about being sent to is darkest Africa. Let me tell you this morning, I've made about eight or nine trips to Africa, and there is light in Africa, okay? There, it's, it's not a totally dark country. There's some light there. Maybe they're afraid that God would call them into the mission. Maybe, maybe they're tremendously afraid that God would call them as a pastor. But you see, discipleship is not where God, it's not the issue of if you surrender, then God may do something with your life that you don't want to do. The disciple's life is a life that says, my Lord gave his all for me and I'm not afraid to give my all for him. And the one thing we find out when we come to Christ is we have a different want to in our life. There are different things that we, we find ourselves desiring, wanting to do. There are things in our life that no longer appeal to us. That's the part of this new life in Christ. If any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. God begins to, to take and exchange our life for his life. And that life is implanted in us through his righteousness, his holiness. And it's this life in which every person serves him. And if you think about the fact, Jesus said we are lights. Think about the fact that you have thousands of people, thousands and millions of people throughout the world who carry the message of Christ and our lights, then the world is a place that has light. And that light is the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so that's basically what a disciple is. I, I wrote down, I look, a follower is a person who follows another person in regard to his ideals and beliefs. Uh, we got people uh, who follow Republicans, follow Democrats, uh, they follow other ideals. There are people that follow all kind of philosophies in this world, and they are simply that. They are following, looking for fulfillment. Because when you follow someone, you're, you're looking for something that you realize doesn't exist within you. But a disciple is simply one who becomes like his teacher. In the days of teachers in Israel, teachers would dress in a certain way. They may have a wear a certain hat on their head. And those disciples who followed that teacher would dress with a hat and the different clothes on them. Uh, they would even speak the same way that their teachers thought because they were going there, they were following this teacher in order to, to know in order to find what they felt like was missing 
in their life. If you look at a uh, college graduation and the master's and the doctor's degrees, they have all kind of different hats that they wear according to the degree of study. That goes right back to the time of Christ when the people who followed teachers, people who followed rabbis, which means teachers, they walk like, they look like, they talk like, they carry themselves like a teacher. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a man that uh, has come to mind during this time. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was a pastor in Germany during the rise of the Nazi, uh, overcome the, the buildup of the Nazi party and the takeover of Germany and Hitler who tried to take over the world. He got all the churches together and the churches began to preach the propaganda that he put out. But there was a couple of men who stood firm. These men I call the disciples, true disciples. And here's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer had to say. Cheap grace is preaching forgiveness without repentance. It's baptism without church discipline. It's communion without confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship. Grace without the cross. Grace without Jesus Christ living and incarnate. God's grace is not cheap. God's grace cost him the life of his beloved son because he loved us and knew there was only one way we could ever have life. Everybody here, we all feel like we're living life. And we've struggled over our lifetime to find out what is that life. And we have many had many worries. We, we worry about our 401k. We worry about what our title is. We wonder where the next promotion can come from, how our children are going to grow up, where they're going to go to college. We begin to, to worry and, and fret about things like how we're going to pay for that college. There's just a lot of things that are involved in life, and a lot of the roads that we follow in life, I'm sure you'll come to agree with me, have become dead ends in our lives. And there's had to be some restarts in our life. When you follow the life of Christ and the life of his disciples, there was absolutely never a dead end to wherever he went. They may have experienced roadblocks. They may have experienced imprisonment. Some of them experienced death. But they always knew the path because Jesus had said to them, I, Jesus, is the way, the truth, and the life. And so by that, as, as people begin to surrender to this, this discipling of their life, this a disciple simply means that you never graduate from discipleship school. High school at 12, at 12 years, you, you graduate, you go into college, you get a, a baccalaureate degree in four years, and your master's and your doctors can depend, and then you're out and you begin to practice. But in reality, a disciple is one who is constantly learning, constantly seeking, constantly following, and the day that we graduate is that blessed day when our Lord calls us home. That's the life of the disciple. Martin Luther said the hardest thing to convert is the pocketbook. And maybe in some instances, but I have really come to realize that I believe that it is the heart, a renewed heart and a renewed mind that is the hardest thing to convert. You see, you can join any social organization. You can order and you can join faith-based organizations. And there are a lot of good that you can do in the community. There are things that people get involved in and do, and they're very good things. But you see, they're not guiding you in life. And the one thing that Christ came to do is to fulfill the law like you and I could not, like you and I would not be expected to fulfill, and through the grace of God, through the forgiveness of sin, reached by faith in God, our life has been given this freedom. And freedom is something that many times we don't know what to do with. I've been in countries that have just experienced a, 
a new release of freedom from communist rule. And there's a lot of confusion in the country. They, they know they're free and they can do anything they want to do, but they don't know what to do. They, because they've not been trained to think. There's been others who have fought for them. The life of Christ, Christ simply wrote us a book. It's more than a manual of life. It's a manual of encouragement. It's a manual of how God from creation created everything that we know and his driving desire was that the world would come to Christ. Because we know in the garden, sin entered from that time in, man was in rebellion. And the only way he could call him back, it wasn't the law that was prescribed. That was looked at as a taskmaster. It's hard to do. And if you're simply trying to live a life today of do's and don't, you live a life that's frustrated and most often you just simply stop what you're doing and give up because you realize you can't do it. But a new creation gives you a life that is worth living. Think about your life right now. Can you truly say that the life that you have is a life that's truly worth living? I mean, in every way. The confusion of what we've gone through. The simple problems and tragedies that we're gonna face in life because we live in this world. We live in a world of death. We live in a war, world of wars. We live in a world of extreme weather. We live in a world that has absolutely been corrupted simply because of sin. And so in the large scale of our life in this pursuit, do we live a life that is worth living? I was thinking about some examples of men in the New Testament that came in contact with Christ. One of them was a man called the rich young ruler. And he told Jesus, I want to follow you. And Jesus said, well, have you done this, this, and that? And the rich young ruler said, yes, for my youth, I've done every bit of it. And then Jesus touched the heart of the problem. He said, okay, good. If you want to follow me, you want to be my disciple, I want you to go give away everything that you've got and then come and follow me. Because you see, we carry, just as we are born into this world with nothing, we are also born into the kingdom of God absolutely with nothing that we can offer God in exchange for salvation, in exchange for this new life. We have nothing to offer, nothing in the future that will do. Nothing, no way to purchase it with any amount of money. It's a free gift, but it costs Christ, and a life worth living is going to cost you something. One of the most tragic messages that's going across the land today is that you can be a disciple and it costs you nothing. But when you really look at the tenets of that belief, it just simply says all you do is say, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus do some of the things that religious people do, and everything's okay. But you see, that doesn't become a life that is worth living. A life that will carry you through conflicts. A life that will carry you through the defeats that you're going to face in this life, simply because you're living life. It is that upward call of a total surrender of that life that Christ gave you. It is a life exchange. My old life for Christ's new life. And everything must be given to him. Heart, mind, soul, and body. And it becomes an attitude of our life. There was another guy that he met. Jesus literally run him up a tree. He was a little short guy, so he got in a tree so he could see. His name was Zacchaeus. He was a tax collector like Matthew one that Christ had called from the tables to follow him. Zacchaeus was a crooked tax collector. In fact, his confession to Jesus was that he had cheated people. And that's the way the Roman tax system worked. You simply cheat people to make your own living. But when he met Jesus, Zac Zacchaeus' life was exchanged. Now, note that Zacchaeus continued to be a tax collector. 
Jesus didn't call him to follow him in the inner circle of the twelve. Jesus called him to be a disciple at the tax tables. You see, Zacchaeus said, I'm going to give back four or five fold of everything that I've stolen. And I imagine the people in that community rejoiced in the fact they now had an honest tax collector because of the result of Zacchaeus' discipleship. They had more of what they had worked for because of the honesty that came into Zacchaeus' life, the honesty that caused him to want to follow Christ and be that life. So I begin to I begin to wonder what are some of the hindrances to the challenge of, of being a disciple? Why is this not pursued? One of them, I think we have to overcome control issues in our life. Who is in control? Who's going to call the shots? Who's going to be the boss? There's a fear of the unknown. The unknown is something that definitely causes fear in people's lives. It's the fear of maybe going to a strange place out of this country and, and, and going on a mission trip and meeting people that you don't know and you can't speak their language. It may be the fear of the unknown of what is this? What's going to happen to me when all of a sudden I surrender everything to Christ? I just say, God, I'm going to give you this life. I'm going to live out your life. It's the fear of the unknown. There's the anxiety of turning loose of something. We have made pets out of our habits. And many of our habits do not lead to a life worth living. They live, they lead us to a life that imprisons us either to stuff or to an addiction. And so there's this anxiety. What will I do? What will it be like when I turn loose my life? Then there's the fear of loss. The fear of loss. What am I going to lose? What is it going to cost me? Those things are hindrances in our life. But I'm, I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ has given us, given us a pathway and a view of what that life is. Matthew chapter 6, beginning in verse 25. He's talking about anxiety, things that we are anxious over, things that we worry about. Therefore, I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you eat or what you drink or what about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns. And yet their Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they are? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow third thrown into the heaven, will he not much more clothe you, O oh, you of little faith? Therefore do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles, and Gentiles in this instance simply means those who believe, unbelief, excuse me, those that do not believe, Seek after all of these things, and your Heavenly Father knows you have need of them. And then God lays down the very first principle and building block of a life that is absolutely worth living. He said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That's simply saying, seek first in your life the reign and the rule of Christ. So that your thoughts are guided, so that... Your, the things that you do, the things that you desire, are those things that God is leading you in his life. The reign, the rule, the living within you, the living out, overcoming that flesh that we all live with. The reign and rule of Christ. And he said, all these things will be added to you. Then he simply said, don't worry about tomorrow. When you wake up tomorrow morning, there'll be enough worries for you 
to worry about. Now, many people take this to say that God is going to provide you with food to eat. He's going to provide you with clothing to wear. Some would add a house to live in, and that's only partially true. But Jesus is not talking about a menu. Jesus is not talking about Amazon, where you go on and order and get what you want. By the very illustrations of the birds in the air and the lilies of the field, Jesus is simply saying to you that in every phase of life, he's got it. In every phase of life, he has plans and purposes for your life. In every phase of your life, what he calls you to do, whether it be volunteer, whether it be given, where it where it may need to go on a mission trip, whatever God leads you to do, to be that deputy with the sheriff's office that people know that when he comes to their house, even though they're, he may come to arrest them, there's something different about that deputy. To be everything that we have in life, doctors, lawyers, uh, you name it, school teachers, housewives. God has said, whatever I call you to be, and to do is my disciple the building block. The first step is to seek my reign and rule in your life. Now that seek means to diligently hunt. It means like if I told you there was a winning lotto ticket out there in that field somewhere that I had buried, you wouldn't casually walk around and say, well, I wonder if it's here or not. That field would be a hole because every one of you would jump out of your car right now, grab a shovel or whatever you got, and start digging. That's what that word seeks means. You look for it, you desire it, and that's the focus of your life. And let me tell you something, you with occupations other than pastors, you live out that occupation with that same goal in life. Running Gospel Gardens, I use Bill, won't get in the way of seeking the reign and rule of Christ in your life. And I think the church, I think Christians have gotten to the idea that they're, they're more comfortable with a title. Someone who is a believer, someone who is a Christian, someone who is a Baptist, someone who goes to Tomoka. We're, we're, we settle for everything that is less than what God has called us to be and to do. And God is saying, I've got it. What I ask of you, I'll provide. Where I send you, I'll show you. I'll open the door. I'll remove the roadblocks. Seek first the reign and rule of Jesus Christ in your life. Because you see, I want to tell you something. There is that initial call to salvation that Christ issues through the Holy Spirit convicting of us of our sin, leading us to repentance and to baptism. But the call does not stop there. In order that God's plans be fulfilled, he is calling us to be people of Christ. So that when we begin to look like him, we talk like him, our compassion is like him, our humility is like him, we grow in that image of the Son. In fact, Scripture tells us that he that began a good work in us, that is God, will complete it into the day of Christ. And that completed work that he's leading to us to is to bear that image, that inner. We're told that we are created in the, the Latin says, imago Deo, which simply means this, this image of Christ. This image that has to be the inward image because like you and I have this body, God is a spirit. And so to bear that image and to be created in that image is talking about that inner man that must be regenerated. But the life that you receive in Christ, from Christ, from the cross, is a life that must be given back to God if you intend on having a life that's worth living. Let me give you an example of what will happen to you. The Apostle Paul, one of the most fearless apostles that we read about. This apostle moved in his life and he said things like this. 
I am crucified with Christ. When he looked at the world and the temptations, when he looked at the things that could come between him and Christ, him and fulfilling that seeking the reign and rule of Christ in his life, he simply said, I've been crucified with Christ. This flesh has been killed. I no longer live in this flesh, but Christ lives in me. The life that I live in this flesh, I live by faith in the blessed Son of God. As I was thinking about this message, I thought about who was the first disciple. And if I were to throw that out as a trivial question, I would get all kind of answers, but I guarantee you I wouldn't get this one. I believe the first example of a disciple in the Bible is a man named Abraham. Abraham. Think about it. God called him out of where he was comfortable, where he had all of his wealth, all of his position, all of his family, and he called him and he just simply said, you see this road? Follow it. I'll let you know when you get there. Abraham followed him. It is said of Abraham that he believed God and God counted that as righteousness. Now, when you look at the life of Abraham, he blew it several times. I mean, you can look at that and say, oh, why did God call Abraham? Well, you see, we look at things that way. I look at you and see things in your life. You look at me and see things in my life. And the conflict and the lack of unity comes from we're looking at each other, making excuses for our weakness by pointing out your weaknesses. But the call of a disciple is a life of eyes on Christ. The eyes on Christ. He is that ultimate goal. Listen, folks, this world is going to come to an end. I've heard more talk of people saying, are we in the last days? I believe we're the rapture of the church is coming. I believe all. But do we really believe that with all of our heart? Because you see, the end of this life is the beginning of the life in Christ. And Christ is going to return. And he's going to set up new heavens and new earth. And he's calling us to inhabit that. And I'm telling you right now, if you've not turned that life to Christ totally and seen the song that says, wherever you lead, I'll go and mean it, then I got news for you. If it wasn't for the transformation we go through when we have those transformed bodies and standing before Christ, not one of us would be comfortable or enjoy heaven for a minute. The reason I know that because we talk about things that are near and dear. The golf course, fishing in this river or that river, how big our mansion's going to be, how big our trophy room's going to be for the crowns that we give. We think of heaven with the eyes of the flesh when we need to understand that our life, even in this flesh, is a life of the Spirit that is controlled by God. In fact, Paul made this statement, and I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna make a confession to you. In my life as a Christian, there have been two statements that I have wrestled with and wrestled with. I have said them, but God has put me in a corner on two statements until I was able in all honesty to say this to God, not as a mantra, uh, not, as, not as something that I remember that sounds good. The first was when I said, God, not my will, but yours. I choked saying those words. Maybe you had an easy time. But I, God put me at a point when I said, Lord, not your will, but mine. It was a time that I sure needed my will because it looked like the things I needed were things that weren't being supplied. But you know, the moment that I said, God, not your, my will, but yours, my life took a different complexity. It was not the anxiety that I lived with. There's not the worry of failure. Oh, I failed, and there are times that I got tense, but my life was different because I've said to him, God, you're going to have to correct me. You're going to have to convict me of sin. <laughs> You're going to have to spank me sometime because I'm going to fail you, but I want your will to be mine. Lately, in the last several months, is this statement that Paul made. For me to live is Christ and to die gain. I want you to think about that. Paul was not frustrated. I've heard people 
because they were frustrated in life. They all wish the Lord would come. Paul didn't say that statement out of being frustrated with life because he was beaten, because he was jailed, because he had all of these issues. Paul moved to the point of discipleship in his life that he realized that for him to live was going to be Christ. Whatever Christ was, he wanted to be. Whatever Christ did, he wanted to do. Whatever attitude Christ had, that's the attitude he wanted. So he said, to live is to Christ. Now, Paul didn't have a death wish because when he was writing another letter, he said to you, I don't know if I'm going to ever come back there. I, I don't know if I'll make it back. I, I, I may die. But he said, I think I'm going to live because it's far better for me to live and come to see you than it is for me to die. Paul knew his mission was not complete. But when he said, for me to live is Christ and to die gain simply means that he had obtained that goal of the reign and rule of Christ in his life. To die as a disciple of Christ is to fulfill the most basic foundation of a life that is worth living. We gain Christ in his presence forever. The battle's over. Our insecurities, our insufficiencies, things that we fail, they're all gone. Because in our life and in our pursuit of Christ, in our seeking Christ, these things begin to drop away from us. They no longer mean anything. You ever gone through your house when you were moving? And you box up everything you think is precious? And you look at the size of the truck you got and you start saying, this is not so good. And you begin to give stuff away. And you give it away. The problem is you move somewhere else and you have more space and you start getting more stuff that'll be junk in six months that you don't want about it. The life of a disciple is not a life of standing still. The life of a disciple is a life that seeks Christ and the things that hinder us drop away from us. Like running a race and you start with heavy boots and long pants and a shirt and a jacket. And you begin to run and it's hot and you start taking jackets off. You change into a pair of shorts. You get rid of the boots. That's the race that we run in Christ. To seek first the reign and rule of Christ in our life is a race in which we are marching towards Christ and we are ridding ourselves of the things, everything that hinders. As I preach this message, I begin to think of the futility of so many of my messages in the church. How many messages I preach begging people to volunteer for something? How many times have I reached out and thought, well, if I preach a message, they'll do it. You know, it's like when the money gets low, you preach a tithing message. That means everybody will listen, everybody will tithe, and things will be okay until they go back to the normal. But stupid me, I realized something. You don't have to ask or beg a disciple of Christ for anything. Because you see, God gets there first. And that's why I think Martin Luther, was some things he would write, this thing is wrong. I believe that when you are captured and converted and give your life away and become a disciple of Christ, that heart, that pocketbook, your time, your talents, your abilities are God's. And there are times in your life to serve Him and play out of this. I got some Bonhoeffer quotes that I'm going to close with. Understand Bonhoeffer said these in troubled times. Probably mentioned it cost Bonhoeffer his life. But here's Bonhoeffer's view. Costly grace is the treasure hidden in the field, where for the sake of it a man will go and sell all that he has. It's the pearl of great pie, price to buy, which the merchant will sell all of his goods. It is the kingly rule of Christ for whose sake a man will pluck out his eye, which causes him to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ in which the disciple leaves his nets and follows him. 
Costly grace is the gospel, which must be sought again and again. It is a gift that must be asked for, a door at which a man must knock. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow. And it's grace because it calls us to follow Jesus. It's costly because it costs a man his life. And it's grace because it gives a man the only true life. It's costly because it condemns sin. Grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, it is costly because it costs God the life of his son. You are bought with a price. And what, has God, what cost has God much cannot be cheap with us. Above all, it is grace because God did not reckon his son too dear a price to pay for our life, but delivered him up for us. Costly grace is the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Two calls in the life of a man, woman, boy, or girl. The call to Jesus Christ. Not a call to religion, not a call to a creed, not a call to a particular denomination belief or the way you do things. It is called a cross to repent of the sins of this life, to reach out for that salvation only offered through the Christ and his blood, and return to discipleship as that command that he said, I'm not looking for merely followers. The people that I call, I am calling to a discipleship far above anything else in life. And what I will give when you sacrifice that call, that following me, is a life that you cannot imagine. It's a life that you could never purchase or buy. And it is a life that has the fulfillment that we gain Christ. There's a song that I love. And Jerry's going to play it for you. You've got the words on a short piece of paper. I just want you to meditate right now. Please don't think about anything else. I want you to look at the words, listen to the words on the radio, and use this time to think about these words. Jerry?
through this morning, and I'm sorry those didn't get out. They were supposed to get out as they came in, but if you listen to that song, that's a, that's a meditation for you. All right, if you've got groceries, I'm going to ask you to pop your trunk. We're going to have some guys here to take them out. We'll put them off to one side. And then as you exit, uh, you'll be able to bring your tithes and offering. Gary will be by the road. Again, next week, we're going to be inside. We will be having communion. I look forward to sitting at that Lord's table with you. And so, God bless you. Have a great week. We'll see you next week.